Some of the headlines I read about the state of the world's oceans are pretty terrifying, from collapsing fish populations to species extinction and mismanagement. But headlines are written to catch our attention, and so I wanted to find out what scientists really think about the state of the world's fisheries. In this conversation, I speak with Professor Trevor Branch from Washington University. Trevor synthesizes data from stock assessments, catches, and surveys to build mathematical models that determine the health and size of fish populations. I came out of this conversation with a more nuanced picture for the environmental trade-offs at play and a greater appreciation for the work and effort that goes into protecting the world's oceans. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast. If you appreciate what I'm doing, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing. And now, Here's Trevor Branch. I hope you enjoy. Escaped Sapiens. All right, then Trevor Branch, welcome on the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. What a pleasure. <laughs> so what I want to do today is I want to get a better or more realistic view of the health of the world's oceans. And I thought I'd start off with something positive to start with. And so very recently in the news, uh, people found, it's been reported that there was this uh, breeding ground that was found, a breeding colony of ice fish with something like 60,000 nesting sites. And the thing that strikes me when I see news articles like this is that it, we're still able to find what looked like pristine, untouched, sort of, we can still find wilderness. And so just to start with, what percentage of the world's oceans are still pristine? What, what percentage are still wilderness and sort of untouched? That's an interesting question. Of course, like a true scientist, I, I'm going to hedge. I, I, don't, I don't know the, the right number. Um, in truth, very little of the ocean is completely untouched because there are far-reaching, you know, impacts of humans in terms of climate change and ocean, ocean acidification, pollution, and so on. So there's no part of the ocean that's truly untouched by human impact. Um, but most of the ocean is not fished, and most fish species are not directly impacted by humans. So in some sense, it's quite different to the land, where most of the land is transformed by human impacts, like mostly farming and deforestation. But in the ocean, you know, direct impacts of fishing, even if you consider all the areas that are fished, within those areas, there are lots of places that aren't directly um, trawled or you know impacted by fishing so so if you think of places like the north sea where it's very very heavily impacted by fishing has been for 130 years or more um there are still parts of the north sea that aren't are not trawled every single year but when you expand that to the rest of the ocean um most of the ocean is not directly fished um every year let alone uh, sorry, not not directly fished over a long period of time, let alone every year. Um, and so it kind of depends on the scale you look at. But there are lots of parts of the ocean that are totally untouched, but usually in pretty remote areas. Could you give some sort of a, if you're going to guess at a percentage of surface area, or, you know? <laughs> I don't know, probably more more than half, maybe as much as 80%. It's probably... Um, pretty not touched by, by human activity, by, by fishing at least, um, in, a, in, a, in a, the course of a decade. I mean, most of the ocean is, is high seas. And so while there is fishing on the surface for tuna and bullfish and so on, there's no fishing on the ocean bottom. Um, and a lot of different fish species are not commercially valuable, including the sort of midwater, small, they call them mesopelagic fish, those are very, very numerous. They're not good eating. They're not really palatable. Um, they have a huge biomass. They're not fished in, to any extent. And there are some others that are, I forget the name, bristle mouth, something like that, um, that occur in deep waters that are also super, super numerous, and those are not fished at all. So there are, there are still vast fishing, fish uh, populations that are not touched by 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 fishing at all. And that includes the, the ice fish example you gave in the, in the Antarctic, mm -hmm. mostly under the ice. Very, very hard to go fishing for them. And um, there's relatively little fishing in the Antarctic. Um, some areas are protected, some areas they're looking for protection. Um, and so if I was gonna guess for one place where you might find something like that, that would be the place. 
One of the things that sort of interested me when I was reading through some of your work and uh, looking at some of your um, presentations is that at least you seem to have a less pessimistic view of things than a than the current narrative in the media would suggest. So uh, you know you hear you know you hear people talking about you know by the mid by mid-century, all fish stocks will have collapsed and will be completely depleted. Um, you're probably aware of this sort of a, a statement. Um, what, what's the, you know, it, what is the currently agreed upon sort of status in terms of depletion and overfishing? Uh, are you able to put, to put some numbers on there? Uh, yeah, so first of all, let me, let me just pivot back to that idea that all of world's fisheries might be collapsed by mid-century that's been, it's not even held by the people that originally came up with that prediction. Mm. So there was a paper saying that um, there was a lot of uh, rigorous discussion, vigorous discussion and lots of rebuttals. And the original authors and a bunch of the people that published rebuttals, including myself, mm. came together and wrote a follow-up paper that didn't find that at all. So the only place you'll see those, the, that kind of prediction is people that don't really care about the underlying science, they, mm -hmm. they just wanted something that sounds dire and they don't really care about the underlying science at all. Mm -hmm. um, as to what the current status of global fisheries is, probably the best, um, the best overview is by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. They, they do a every two year summary of what's happening in the world's fisheries. And the current number there is, I think it's about 34%. Mm -hmm. of the world's fisheries are overfished, so at lower levels than they should be. And the rest are not overfished. So they're either sustainably fished, what they call fully exploited, or they're um, lightly harvested or not harvested at all, which is what they call the sort of underexploited um, category. Mm -hmm. So roughly a, a third overfished and two thirds not overfished. Um, and that's it could be better. That trend has been getting slightly worse over time. Um, so we could certainly be doing better than we are. Mm -hmm. um, but the key is to remember that there's some places in the world that are well managed and others that are not. And I'm fortunate enough to have worked in a lot of places where fisheries are well managed. South Africa, New Zealand, the US, Canada, um, you know, very generally speaking, most fisheries in those places are well managed well-regulated, sustainably fished. Uh, most uh, fish stocks that were overfished are recovering. And the few that are depleted have their catch levels cut so that they should promote recovery. So I'm pretty optimistic that we can manage fisheries well, that we can rebuild fish stocks. Um, and that gives me a sense of good optimism for the rest of the world. Are the numbers well known in the poorly managed places though? Like, so, you know, if, if you were going to say, if I asked you the question, you know, is, is, is uh, marine um, biomass decreasing or increasing, would you be able to put a uh, thumb down on an answer there or is that not currently possible? Um, it's very regionally based. And so, um, you know, places that are well managed on average, biomass is going up now. Uh, those are places we have good data for. And the problem is that the places that um, mostly in poorer areas, mostly in areas that have lots and lots of species, so I think tropical reefs, mostly in areas where there are not, you know, a, a big industrial fleet that's easy to control, but it's a small artisanal fleet with hundreds of thousands of boats going out that are not, not easy to control. And Often those, those are also places that people are fishing not for profit, but they're fishing for subsistence. Mm. So, you know, cutting back on fishing would lead to people not having enough protein or nutrients in their, in their diet, not enough money to put food in the table, things like that. Mm. Um, so there's really, there's really two, two groups of places in the world. And, and in those areas that are, um, say, poorer, um, harder to manage, um, we don't have good data, but probably they're not doing well mm -hmm. and probably their trend is going, is getting worse over time. Um, so indications we do have suggest that's the case. And then the richer countries, 
which have had a long history of overfishing and depletion and bad management have tended to turn things around over the last 20 to 30 to 40 years. Um, even places where, like Europe, where we would have said were the, the classic case of overfishing, everything is overfished, there's no hope, you know, there's just it's all politics and no one listens to the science. You know, I think there's some good signs that, um, that catches are being held to sustainable levels in many fisheries. I won't say all fisheries, but and hopeful signs that biomass is recovering even in Europe. What does it mean? So when, when people talk about overfishing, is it an economical definition? Is it an ecological definition? You know, does it, so for example, can I have a, a sustained area, which is def defined as just sustained because the biomass is held constant where nevertheless there are species that are going extinct or so how do these definitions work? Oh, well, I mean, if you want, if you want, if you want to know what the scientific community thinks, you ask 10 people and you'll get 20 different opinions about what, whatever fishing is. So <laughs> like everything else, if you ask scientists, don't expect a clear answer. Um, uh, th there are several ways of looking at it. So if you're looking at it from the perspective of a conservationist, then almost any form of fishing will re result in the, in the number of fish going down on average, and some impact to the ecosystem. And the things that those fish eat and the things that eat those fish will obviously have some impact to them. So that's going to be one perspective that people have. Any, any form of fishing causes the target species to go down in abundance. Mm -hmm. um, the, the sort of fisheries perspective, the fisheries manager perspective would be, we're going to manage this fishery to maximize the amount of catch we can take out of it and still have it be sustainable in perpetuity. Um, and so from the fisheries manager perspective, it's a maximum sustained yield. How do we ensure that we can maximize how many fish we catch out of this fishery? And that typically leads to reducing the, the abundance by about 60%. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the conservationists would say, wow, you've lost 60%. That's a terrible thing. And the fisheries managers would say, we're doing exactly what we're planning to do. And we're <laughs> maximizing the, the money and jobs and food we're getting from this fishery while not collapsing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so the, from a fisheries management point of view, overfishing is when you reduce the biomass so far down that you're not getting sustainable catches that are close to the maximum, the optimum. Um, now... Yeah, so I would say that those are sort of two um, perspectives. Now, you can also, even if a fishery has been knocked to very low levels, well below the sort of optimum levels, you can keep on fishing it sustainably. It would just be not getting the highest possible catch that you could get. Mm -hmm. You'd be getting a sustainable low level of catch, right? So I, you'd I, be losing money, losing jobs, and so on. And, and, and in some places, um, politicians may choose to stay there because rebuilding to the optimum level would result in a short-term loss of jobs and profits and income and food and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so there's even, there are even economic arguments that if you were to try and rebuild, the lost money from the rebuilding stage would be so much you would never make it back in some fisheries or, or at least for the people who are currently in the fishery they would never see the benefits that would come five or ten years down the line after it's rebuilt so I you see. know if you're sitting on the on the docks in some port in england and you say well everybody the bad news is cod is overfished and um if we rebuild it to twice the current levels you'd be able to get an extra 10 percent of catches five years from now Mm -hmm. but we have to close the fishery for five years. And then five years from now, you'll get an extra 10%. Your catches will be 10% higher. You can see how that argument may, may not be that popular amongst the fishing industry. Surely you could make, economically. Surely you could make a different, uh, sorry for interrupting, a different argument yeah. where you say you can reduce your catch by X percentage, not, not completely stop it, but just reduce by a little bit. And over time, uh, you'll see increasing profits. Th that may be more palatable to people, no? 
Yeah, and, that, and that's the sort of trade-off. So, so how do you ensure you get to the optimum level without, you know, causing too much economic disruption or, or whatever? And, and that, that, again, is a, is a question of, you know, what are your values? Mm-hmm. If you're a pro-conservation type argument, you would say, well, let's just close the fishery down until everything is rebuilt. And we don't care what happens to the fishing industry. And if you're, you didn't want minimal disruption to the fishing industry, then your argument might be, well, let's cut catches by 5% and do that for 15 years, and then we'll end up with higher catches. Mm-hmm. So, so, so when you, know, you say that, uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, something like 60, 70% of fisheries are sustainable, was that the number you, you gave? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's according to some baseline. Do, do we know what the, it sounds like, if I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that, so, that's do, the, the optimum yield, the maximum sustainable yield baseline. Yeah. So do we know then, so is some comparison made, just so I understand, but is some comparison made to a hundred years ago and we say, okay, it's 60% of what stocks were a hundred years ago before say industrial fishing or, or how is the baseline set? Like it, how, how is that analysis done? Yeah, so that's that's a great question, and um, in theory, it is based on the baseline pre-fishing baseline, what will give you the optimum yield, and usually around forty percent of pre-fishing baseline. Um, in practice, a lot of the times, uh, a lot of the time, there's no baseline to measure against. We weren't collecting data a hundred years ago, one hundred and twenty years ago, when some fisheries started. Um, and so in practice, you're basing that on data collected usually in the most recent 20 years, 30 years, maybe 40 years. And so there is a danger of shifting baselines is what it's called, a, a term popularized by Daniel Pauly, um, that every generation sees what they grew up with as being normal and pristine, not realizing that from their generation to the previous generation, things were degraded. And the previous generation thinks what they started off with was pristine, but it's well below what the generation before them was. Um, and so one of, I think one of the promising um, ways of getting around this is, is marine reserves or marine protected areas. So if you're close to fishing a certain portion of your coastline, say 20 or 30% is a, is a common goal in, in some places, uh, you leave it for five or 10 years, the, the biomass in those areas is going to rapidly rebound. They've, they've, you've seen that over and over again, pr- provided they don't all swim out of the reserve and get caught. You know, if, if enough of them stay there, you'll see a pretty rapid increase in, in biomass. And you can use that as your baseline to say, oh, wait a minute, in this area we closed, there are now 10 times as many fish as there are in the area that, that's open to fishing. And so it's pretty clear that the area open to fishing might only be at 10% of baseline levels. So I've always seen that as a good, as a good check on, on what our estimates of the pre-fishing levels, carrying capacity is the technical term, uh, might be. Either that or the fish are learning what we're doing and avoiding, <laughs> which may actually be the case with some, for example, whales, which I imagine are quite smart, may be avoiding, uh, I think they do avoid old uh, hunting grounds, right? If you look at... Um, not really. No? Not, yeah. not, 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 not for the dead I've collected for whales. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that not, that not, is another specialty of yours, avoided. isn't it? Sorry, what? That's another specialty of yours, isn't it? Yeah, I've done a lot of work on whales as well. Mm. That's my side interest. So... Uh, back to, so my original question was about, uh, you know, um, how do you account for, for example, so if it's an, it sounds like it's more of an economic uh, definition, uh, sustainability that is. So one thing that you, you often see in the the news or recently has been news is, um, people talk about a seabird populations declining, you know, 70% or something like this over the past couple of decades. And also, um, discussion about shark numbers declining. And you also hear talk of um, coral reefs being heavily affected, not only by coral bleaching, but also from effects of uh, fishing. You wipe out species that sort of look after the reef. Um, and so how, how do these... Is, so first off, is, is, is it the case that we're seeing 70% reduction, say, large sharks and 70% percent 
production in seabirds. And, and how does this pass with uh, the idea that fisheries are being uh, well managed or, or managed at sustainable levels if we're seeing this decrease, if indeed we are seeing a decrease in um, uh, the numbers of these other species? Well, of course, each, each of those has its own set of factors affecting them. Um, so for sharks, the main factor is fishing and sharks are caught. Um, there are some directed fisheries, but sharks are often caught as bycatch, as accidental catch in tuna fisheries and bullfish fisheries. Um, and, you know, those direct shark fisheries and indirect catches are causing declines in sharks. So that's pretty well established. Um, so if you want to stop that, you put restrictions on fishing in those areas that are catching too many sharks. You, you know, reduce the practices that are really harmful, like catching sharks and cutting the fins off and then throwing the rest of the shark back overboard. You know, that seems kind of dumb to me and wasteful. Um, so, yes, so direct fishing is a, is a big impact on sharks and that can be controlled and should be controlled. Um, seabirds, I'm, I'm not as familiar with uh, overall declines. Um, my general impression is that some seabird populations are doing badly and some are not, and it depends where you are, and that's very localized. And some of that's some of that might be due to fishing on the, the fish that the seabirds like. Um, some fish colony, some seabird colonies depend on bycatch and discard from fishing boats for a lot of their food. Um, <laughs> So banning discards, as they've done in Europe, can actually uh, negatively impact um, seabird colonies. Um, and a lot of it is just uh, climate change and changing environmental conditions. So, you know, if you have bad environmental conditions for seabird food, they're not going to do well and they're going to do badly. Um, but I would think that's, you know, the reasons for seabirds depend where you are. Um, and then it, coral reefs suffer a lot of different impacts. Mm -hmm. Part of that is fishing. So a lot of coral reefs have um, fisheries that are local and small scale and have depleted many of the fish in that area close to human populations. So pristine coral reefs tend to be far away from human populations. Um, and, and you layer on top of that pollution and sediment from, from runoff from, from land um, over fertilization, disease, warming, you know, all these things seem to impact coral reefs much more than, than, than other areas of the ocean. Um, and the kind of work I've, I've looked at for coral reefs has been ocean acidification. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure you know all about this, but this is just basically the basic question of chemistry. You put lots more CO2 in the, in the air, it ends up in the water, when you add CO2 to water, it's just like making a fizzy drink, like Coca-Cola. Fizzy drinks are acidic, and adding more CO2 to the to the to the water results in the water becoming more acidic. It's still above like the neutral pH level, but it turns out that coral reefs need really, really basic water, non-acidic water, to build their skeletons. And as the pH goes down, which it is going down it becomes harder and harder and harder to build the coral reef skeletons. Um, and so that will have an impact, um, is probably having an impact now and will continue to have an impact into the future. Mm. So coral reefs are certainly going to be the hardest of all to manage because big human populations close to coral reefs, fishing, pollution, runoff from, the, from land, Climate change, ocean acidification, mm. all those things are going to hit coral reefs before they will hit and affect other areas of the ocean. Mm. I, it, it sounds like it's really hard to do triage. So you've got all these different things coming in and sort of damming these areas of, uh, you know, these really important uh, marine zones. And, you know, you, you want to implement policy, which is sensible. And, you know, there might be one group saying, oh, it's acidification. The other group is saying it's overfishing. The other group is saying it's, you know, um, whatever, you know, there could be all these different um, inputs. So how do you, in practice, how do you actually pull apart and do triage so that you can make sensible policy? Um, how is that work done in, in practice? Um, I'm not a coral reef expert, so I really haven't worked in those systems very much. 
Um, I can only talk about me going on vacation to some beautiful places <laughs> and you know going out and going snorkeling and oh wait there are, there are no there's no coral here and there's no fish here that's it's all just you know scum in the Caribbean where I was out there and, and I was like wow this is really different to what I've seen in other places um, and you know I think the answer is that you can tackle each one of those problems but it's really really hard to tackle climate change and ocean acidification but that's a global level thing that you know a bunch of you know Caribbean and South Pacific islands are not going to solve by themselves because they're not the ones producing all the carbon dioxide. But they can work on rebuilding their fish populations and making sure that there are enough fish grazing the algae so it's not the seaweed's not overgrowing the coral, that um, there's not a lot of runoff from land from from agriculture sending salt and, and, and silting up the coral reefs. Mm. Um, so there are some things they can work on. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest systemic problems are tough ones that require global action. When it comes to regulations, do governments act in sort of a comparative way or an absolute way? By which I mean, you know, you, you have, so we need to produce food for the, the world's population and you need to produce a certain amount of protein and so on. And so you could be producing that using cattle or you could be producing it using um, you know, by fishing or fish farms, whatever it is that you're doing. And so, you know, when we're thinking about management, do we have this separate entity that goes, I care about fish and I want to protect fish to the exclusion of all else and, and so on and so forth. So that you also have people that are thinking of agriculture separately or do these different uh, areas of management sort of interact with, with one another? I guess a short way of saying the question is, um, you know, if, if we reduce the amount of fish protein that we're intaking, does that lead to some run on effect, uh, you know, additional agricultural damage because we're eating more burgers <laughs> or is, do these different management systems work in lockstep with one another and try to reduce it in aggregate in total, um, the damage that's being done? Um, well, in practice, usually there's a separate fisheries management organization and a separate agriculture organization and a separate human health organization and a separate economic indicator organization and a commerce organization and all of them work independently and then each of them is trying to manage their thing as best they can so the fisheries people are trying to get say optimum yield get this, as much catch as they can sustainably into the future and they're not thinking about how that impacts agriculture or commerce or anything else um, and, the, and the people doing agriculture and raising cattle are not thinking this might affect fisheries. Um, what you hope is that um, the government itself integrates all that information coming from the different agencies and makes decision, decisions that weigh up the impacts of each of those things. So, so to go back to say, say you're on a, on a small Caribbean island and, you know, you might make a different decision if 90% of the income of your island and the jobs come from uh, agriculture. So I don't know, sugarcane used to be a big crop. I'm not sure it is anymore, but you know, say it was sugarcane. If 90% of your income came from sugarcane and the fisheries manager said, look, the runoff from the sugarcane is damaging the reefs and it's causing our fish catches to go down 5%, you may make the decision that you don't care about the coral reefs. Whereas if you live on, a, on an island where agriculture accounts for 5% and it's small scale and there's no runoff and fisheries accounts for 90% of your income and protein and everything, you may do everything possible to ensure that the fish are sustainably managed, that there's say some areas set aside for tourism where there's no fishing, some areas set aside to make sure that fishing uh, spawning aggregations are protected. You may do everything you can to ensure there's no runoff from land that affects the coral reefs. You'd make very different decisions. And so governments, we hope that our elected officials are making wise decisions based on all available information. And the truth is what they're doing is balancing trade-offs. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and you- very often economic, you know, jobs and economic value and GDP counts for more than, you know, are our fisheries sustainable? Do you, do you think our values are in the right place there in your sort of personal opinion, or do you think they're well off? I think that uh, generally science does not play as big of a role as I would like it to play in most government decisions. But I also recognize that science isn't the only thing in society. And if we are trying to make sure that our science is relevant, we have to also be looking at the questions that are relevant to governments and policymakers. That if we're spending all our time doing science that's interesting, but not directly relevant to people's lives, then we're not going to have much attention paid to what results we get. Mm. Um, but also, scientists don't shout very loudly. Mm. I think, the, I don't know if you've seen the movie, Don't Look Up. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty much like my whole life. <laughs> and I would say that the, the countries I've worked in have been very good at listening to science, following it, and, and having sustainable fisheries. Um, but still, I think that you know, society as a whole, you know, the idea that if you do some science and it suggests you should take some action, that society is going to do that action. Um, I think in reality, you know, a lot of people are not going to follow that advice. Mm. Um, and some governments may be more or less hostile to thinking about the effects of science and how they should change policy mm. without naming names. <laughs> I, I think the question is important because, you know, at the beginning when you said that, um, correct me if I'm wrong with these numbers, but it, 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 sustainably, uh, if you run a fisheries um, sustainably, then you may be running at 40% the original cap- capacity in terms of um, biomass. Yeah. And to, to someone like me, at first, that sounds quite terrifying. I, I'm, I should say truthfully, it, it does sound terrifying because in my brain, I'm comparing that 40% to the 100%. But that, yeah. may, that may not be the comparison that should be made because, you know, you have to compare to, you know, if we weren't doing this, then what's the damage we would be making in some other area? And, and so, so the relevant question that I, I want to ask is, do, do you know, in terms of uh, production of protein, how, how does, um, you know, eating fish or uh, farm, farm fish or catching fish compare to, say, Uh, meat production in terms of, for example, carbon dioxide uh, release and those sort of metrics? Well, very generally, um, very, very generally, eating seafood is better than eating meat, but being vegetarian is better than eating seafood, Mm. right? So if you think think in terms of land use, CO2 production, and all the other factors, generally eating seafood is better than eating um, terrestrial uh, uh, meat. but it does depend a lot on which types of seafood you're eating and which types of meat you're talking about and which type of farming. You, you know, there's, there's a lot of variability in there. So, so if you want to be really, really good at your carbon footprint, then eat small little schooling fish like sardines and anchovies and herring mm. because it's really efficient to go out and encircle a big school and catch them without expending a lot of CO2. Mm. Um, if you if you're worried about carbon footprint, then I believe shrimp is not great because you're having to expend a lot of energy trawling for them, and not very much of what you catch is shrimp. Um, so some forms of fishing are worse than other forms of fishing. Um, and then things like aquaculture for um, mussels, clams, oysters. I mean, they're filter feeders. They're sitting there. They're cleaning the water <laughs> of all the the bad nutrients that we're adding to the water because of our farm activities and they're producing uh, protein at very, very low carbon uh, at cost and very, very efficiently. So mollusks are mollusks like, like clams and mussels and oysters are a really, really good way of getting your protein. Um, mm-hmm. So would that be your recommendation? Uh, veganism and bivalves combined or? Um, generally, yeah, generally. Uh, um, but of course, if everybody did that, there wouldn't be any fish left. <laughs> the, you know, there's not enough seafood production to feed the whole world on a seafood diet. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's not enough fish in the ocean to do that. So, you know, we can only produce as much as is 
sustainable. And it seems like about 100 million tons a year, which sounds like a big number, uh, but that's about as much as we can really produce from the ocean, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more, depending on how you count the discards and unreported catches and so on. Um, but I just want to also point out that, you know, on land, we should talk about biodiversity loss. So if you're catching fish at a sustainable level, the target fish are down to 40%. The non-target fish are much closer to being at a pristine level. And some of them will be caught accidentally and damaged accidentally, but, but generally they'll be at a higher level than the target species. But now think of driving through the, the US Midwest or driving through you know, parts of Europe. None of that is pristine forest or prairie. So if you're driving through the, the, the cornfields of the U.S. Midwest, the loss of biodiversity there is 100%. Mm. Right? Every native species of grass is gone. Uh, maybe there are a couple of birds flying around, but you know I would guess the bird loss is close to 100%. Insect loss is close to 100%. Mammal loss, except for rodents, is close to 100%. You know? uh, compare that to fishing where most things are close, either close to pristine or maybe they're down to 40% or in a really, really overfished system, they might be down at 10%. Um, even so, they're still doing better than, than a cornfield. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean... A... But what happens if... So just to... You know, you hear about, for example, in uh, Yellowstone National Park that uh, when wolves were taken out, the entire system sort of you know, went feet up. Um, and when they reintroduced them, then everything went sort of back to normal again. Yeah. We were, we were talk talking earlier on about um, the decreasing numbers of sharks. So can you have, let's say, for example, you said it was 100 million tons uh, per year you can take out sustain sustainably. Let's say you continue doing that, but uh, through, through that process, you remove um, some keystone species like... Um, you know, sharks or, or, or some other species like this. Is, is there a risk of this happening in the, under the current? You know, can we maintain what we're currently doing and avoid those sorts of um, things from happening? Or are we at risk there as well? Well, anything you do is going to have a knock-on effect. So, so fishing has, a, has an effect. There's, there's no such thing as getting protein without any effect on the environment. Um, and I, as I pointed out to ag agriculture, that's a 100% effect. So you took out everything. There's nothing left. There's no knock-on effect on anything else because there's nothing left. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is true if you chop down the Amazon rainforest to, to produce grasslands where you have your cattle feeding to feed people with burgers. Now, the biodiversity loss there is also close to 100%. Um, now, in the ocean, yes, if you take out the predators, you expect the prey to increase. If you take out the prey, you expect the predators to, to decrease. And so we expect all those kinds of, of effects. And, and people, um, I would say the, the person that's done the most work on this is probably Billy Christensen. Um, and he's developed a lot of models, ecopath and ecosim models is what they're called. Um, and the overall impact appears to be the top predators have gone down mm -hmm. on average, maybe 50 or 60%. And, but the, the, their prey has actually increased compared to pre-fishing levels. So that's what the models, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily observational data. I would say that's somewhat observation and somewhat model prediction. Mm -hmm. um, but if your models predict the prey will increase when you reduce the predators, then the prey is going to increase. Is this the so, reason why, is this the reason why you can maintain uh, stability while fishing? Because what you're doing is you're replacing the um, highest trophic level. Is, is that what's happening? You know, so it previously would be, for example, wolves were in, you know, imagine we were the ones that were eating the deer in, uh, in the are. park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you, you just replace the, what the wolf is doing in the system and then you can maintain a stable system, right? Or, um, you know, the, the same thing here. Are we just replacing the top predators in, in the marine ecosystem. And, and that's why we can maintain stability at these lower rates. Well, I have actually done some work on this myself. And it turns out that when you look at global catches, 
it's not true that we're catching more top predators than we're catching the prey. So if you look at if you look at all the all the things that we we fish on, and rank them from the bottom of the food web to the top of the food web, and you look at their trends and catches over time, all those trends have been going up over time. So we're catching more things at the bottom of the food web, and we're catching more in the middle of the food web, and we're catching more at the top of the food web. All those are going up, um, and then and then sort of reaching a plateau in the last fifteen or twenty years. So you know, individual species groups can fluctuate greatly. The catches can go up and down a lot, especially for the smaller fish like Anchovetta of Peru is a classic example where the catches fluctuate by, by millions of tons from, from one decade to the next. Um, but overall, we're catching more of everything than we were in 1950. And um, if you look at the overall sort of mean level where we're catching, it really hasn't changed that much over time. Mm-hmm. So is, are we able to increase our fishing quotas because of technology? Is that, that what's allowing us to catch more today? Or um, is it because of the managed systems that we're able to pull out more? Uh, we're just fishing more things than we were 50 years ago. And, and also 50 years ago, we weren't catching close to the, the sort of optimum mm-hmm. yield that we could get from the, the oceans. We hit that level in the, depending on how you look at the data, probably the mid 1980s. We first sort of got to a point where the global catches started leveling off. Mm-hmm. Um, and some say they're about the same as they were ever since then. And some say they're going down. Um, so it seems like we've pretty much reached our limits of what we can catch now. But compared to the 1950s, we're catching a lot more of everything than we were back then. Um, and the reason for that is part technology. We got better at catching things. Part, we got better at finding resources. Part, we got better at creating new markets to market things that formerly weren't considered marketable. Mm -hmm. So all those factors, there are a lot of people trying to make money out of this, of course. Develop new markets, develop new products, find new resources, fish in new places, fish in deeper waters, fish in waters further away from land. Um, You know, there aren't a lot of unfished fish populations left in the world. There, there are some, uh, but most of the ones that are left are either very inaccessible mm-hmm. or they're uh, low value or they're not very nutritious. Mm-hmm. Um, so Antarctic krill, lanternfish, mesopelagic fish, those bristle mouths that live in deep, deep waters, all those are, uh, don't give you much money if you catch them. They're not very palatable. Um, and they're difficult to access. Mm-hmm. So the, the the value in what a, a fishing fleet will go after is really what the market says, what people find tasty. Um, oh yeah, yeah, and and it's very obvious that that the pattern of fisheries exploitation over time has been first find the ones that are easy to catch, mm-hmm. shallow water, you know, abundant, high value, mm-hmm. and then you move to ones that are less valuable, further offshore, um, lower value, and you keep on moving on until, you know, you, you, you end up with things that you're not getting, making money out of. But as technology improves and processing abilities improve, you know, some of those things might become accessible to, to, to fishing in the future. So this, this is one question that I was a little bit worried about because, um, you know, I imagine there is, I don't know if this is true, but I, I'd imagine there is some sort of a protective, an economic protective mechanism in place for some species, because if you were doing targeted fishing, I'm not talking about trawling, but if you're doing really targeted fishing and you're going after, say, for example, bluefin tuna or whatever it is that you, you want, um, does there become a point where it's just not economically viable to you know, expend more and more effort seeking out the last of whatever species you're after, you know, because it's highly valuable. Um, you know, it, it, the thing I'm worried about is, is, is do you end up at this like economic bound or does technology allow us to always go past it or is it, or is indiscriminate fishing allowing us to always go past it and then lead, leading to um, uh, extinction? Right. So if you were just targeting a single species, there are very few fish species that you could fish to extinction and still make money. 
right? So if you think of, think of, of bluefin tuna, right? Mm. So most of the bluefin tuna are not getting the million dollars per fish that you see in the first auction of every year. Most of them are getting, you know, okay, thousands of dollars per fish. But running a boat costs thousands of dollars per day or tens of thousands of dollars per day, mm. all right? So if you want to go and find the last bluefin tuna in the ocean, you would need a fleet of a thousand boats fishing for several years to go and find it. Mm -hmm. And clearly you're not going to make money from catching the last one, no matter how valuable it is. You, know, you, you would have to get, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for that last fish to make it worthwhile. So there is an economic limit for ocean fishing where most fish are not easy enough to find that you could go and hunt and catch the last one and make money. If you, if you, dealing with a single species. Where it gets more tricky is that we don't just catch one species at a time. So you could deplete bluefin tuna, and then while you were fishing for another species of tuna, if you happen to catch some bluefin tuna, well, that's great. You make some extra money. Mm. Um, and the same is true on land. So if you're a poacher going for rhinos, um, are you going to go and try and poach rhinos in a game reserve, if there's one rhino left, probably not. It's, you know, it's probably not going to be worth your while. But if you were poaching elephants, which were still more numerous and maybe not as valuable, but they used to, could still make some money off them, and you happen to come across a rhino, mm. then you would probably poach the rhino because it's more valuable. So that's a mechanism for extinction. Um, and some colleagues in my, and, and I looked at that and, and, and found examples of that in all different arenas from fishing to hunting to poaching to logging where uh, this sort of opportunistic exploitation could lead to extinction or, or great depletion. So that's, so that's one mechanism. Another mechanism is that if you're fishing with a relatively indiscriminate type of fishing gear, like a, a trawling gear, and you're trying to catch bottom dwelling valuable commercial species, but at the same time, you're also catching sharks and skates and things that aren't at all valuable. Mm -hmm. Some of those things you catch might have a very a slow growing lifestyle. They might not produce very many offspring every year. They might be very slow growing. And so purely accidentally, you could reduce those faster than you, you, you're reducing your target um, your target uh, a fishery um, but the economics are funny you know most fisheries um, even things like orange ruffy it's better to fish them when they're slightly above the optimum level mm -hmm. slightly more fish available because it costs less to catch them if there are lots of them mm. I so yes yeah, so an omniscient fisheries manager who wanted to make as much money as possible instead of catch as much fish as possible would generally want to have the fish be at a higher abundance level than the optimum yield level. But so then how does that story translate to the individual fishermen? So is there any economic incentive? Imagine there were no regulations. Is there any economic incentive for the individual guy with a boat to hold off catching? There's not, right? It's only when you look across... Um, the full population of, or the full fleet that uh, it makes sense to hold off catching the match maximum, right? Yeah, and that's why we have fisheries regulations because otherwise every individual person would, even though they know at the back of their mind they're catching too much and they want to rebuild the fishery, if I hold off on fishing, someone else is going to catch it. Mm -hmm. So that's why you need some government regulation to ensure it works. But there are lots of cases, lots of fisheries now where um, the, the industry, the people catching the fish have been given a, a long-term right or a share in the, in the, in the quota. So, so there are things called individual transferable quotas, or some people call them catch share fisheries, where you divide up that quota amongst all individual boats or individual owners of boats or however you want to divide it up. And then each person has that right to catch a certain amount of fish every year. Mm -hmm. And what you find in those systems is, is very often the industry gets together and has a, an industry body that tries to manage how things work. Mm -hmm. um, and so that body starts to say things like, wait a minute, we could all make more money if we just 
let the fishery rebuild a bit and get up to higher levels. We'd have higher catch rates. We'd spend less money catching fish. And we'd still have almost as much fish to catch. Like our income would go up because our expenses would go down. Prices would go up a little bit because we aren't competing with each other. And, um, and so in those fisheries, you do see those incentives all aligned. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have a fishing industry that wants the fish to be abundant so they can make more money. I see. In general, is it good that there's ownership of the ocean? So, for example, um, I imagine you can have situations where you have a species of fish which uh, travels long distances and it goes from one region which is protected into a region where it's not and it gets overfished in some other region. Um I, I imagine these sort of transitory fish do worse than ones that are in a location where people have, you know, the, the country has this idea that this is a resource that belongs to us. We should manage it. And there's no competition with some other country to, you know, to <laughs> grab the fish before it's gone. Yeah. Um, it, is it beneficial? You know, we have international waters. Do you think it would be beneficial uh, for those waters to also be carved up and, you know, doled out to various countries uh, who could manage them or, or would that not be beneficial? We've done that already. But only I mean, out a certain distance, right? It, it, has, it, it sounds like it has been beneficial. Well, I mean, 50, let me, when did they start doing it? 60 or 70 years ago, uh, nations only had rights to, I forget how far it was, 12 nautical miles away from their, uh, their, their shores. Maybe it was three. And everywhere else, people could go fish. So you could go fish off the shores of the UK just as long as you weren't within that, that boundary. Mm-hmm. Um, and gradually, that got extended further and further out, and currently it's 200 nautical miles. So a lot of the world's fisheries are contained within that boundary already. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's left is two groups. One is the true high seas fisheries, mostly tuna, bullfish, so the swordfish and, and so on of the world and sharks. Mm-hmm. Um and the other, is, the other is fish that go across borders. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you're lucky, you have some management body that controls how you fish those things across borders that has all the countries reaching an agreement. That's much harder than reaching an agreement within a country, which is hard enough. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are management bodies that do that for high seas fisheries that control how many tuna you can catch. There's a, one for southern bluefin tuna that you know all the countries that catch it come together and, and reach agreement it's just much harder to have countries reach agreement mm-hmm. than it is to have one country make a decision mm-hmm. and very often those management bodies have at their basis consensus so if all the countries don't agree on a catch level then it's free for all mm-hmm. you know and then you come back to that problem again of if one country is a bad actor, they want to catch whatever they want, are the other countries going to stick to their limits and let that sort of rogue country catch whatever they want? Or are they just going to say, forget it. If you're going to catch whatever you want, then our fishing industry is going to catch whatever we want as well. So it mm-hmm. gets very, very difficult. Um, um, and even, even agreements between um, you know, US and Canada can fall apart. This yeah. two, two friendly countries can fall apart over fishing rights um, and they can you know, fail to reach consensus. So what's happening then, for example, in the South China Sea where there are these border disputes between uh, China and the various neighboring countries? It, it, do you know if there's been an increase in fishing there or are there not numbers? I don't really know much about that region, so I'm not sure I can, I can comment on that. I would say, obviously, any any region where multiple countries are disputing about who owns the waters mm-hmm. is going to be a bad situation. Um, mm-hmm. And we've seen in the past that that can lead to a lot of conflict, um, you know, to the point of I've seen reports saying that some, some countries in the South China Sea are sending out armed vessels to chase off boats from other countries. Mm-hmm. And obviously, that kind of conflict is, is bad in general. Um, so I can't imagine it's good for the for the fish stocks either. I, I imagine management is more or less impossible. And I guess they're also making these uh, artificial islands, right? That must be really yeah. destructive. Do, do you know anything about uh, 
what impact that sort of thing would have on on fish stocks? Well, I assume if they're taking a, a little coral atoll that used to have fish around and coral reefs and, and concreting it over, <laughs> concrete on top of that, I'm sure the biodiversity loss of 100%. <laughs> so on the other hand, if that island is is uh, got an entire army based on it, uh, an air force and so on, and no one's fishing around it, maybe that eventually would lead to a, a semi-marine uh, protected area if it's allowed to recover again. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it can't be good. <laughs> um, okay. So in terms of regulations, uh, if, okay, you, you're a fisherman and you, you're going out trawling and you have a massive net that pulls up everything that it sort of touches, how, how does the regulation work? So if, if I'm trawling for flounder or something and I pull up, you know, some, ex, you know, nearly extinct species and it dies on board my, my ship am i liable or how, how does that work out how, how do the licenses work so a lot depends on what it is um so you i mean i i can talk about the u.s west coast where i've done some work myself and i'm much more familiar with the system there mm -hmm. so so the trawlers there a couple of things that they don't trawl everywhere so there are only some places they can trawl because there are big rocks on the bottom and you know, cliffs and mountains and stuff. So you 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 don't want your your gear to get stuck mm -hmm. or ripped or tear or torn up. So you prefer to trawl in places where it's it's muddy rather than places where it's rocky. And their regulations to encourage them to 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 not fish in the in the rocky areas that would tend to have more uh, coral or things that are damaged. Mm -hmm. um, so. What you typically find is that the fishing industry industry has places they know are safe to fish. They'll go and trawl those areas again and again and again, and the fish will come back in. You know, they trawl them, the fish move around, they come back, they can trawl the same area again. So the actual area impacted by the bottom trawls is not 100%. It's more like 20 or 30%, and the rest is not, is not trawled very often or at all. Um, but... They also now have regulations in place where basically every species of fish has a quota. Okay. <laughs> right. And this gets cumbersome for the, for the people at fishing because um, you might have quota. I think I forget the exact numbers. It's something like 30 or 40 species of fish now have quota on them. And the quota is divided up amongst all the people fishing. So you go fishing, and if you go over your quota for a particular fish species, you have to buy or lease it from somebody else to cover your overage. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if you happen to catch something like a yellow-eye rockfish that's at very low levels, um, to lease the quota from somebody else becomes very, very expensive, mm -hmm. way more than you get from selling the fish. I see. Okay. So there's an incentive then, an economic incentive, to not fish anywhere you think there might be that yellow-eye rockfish species. So, so this is a way of providing incentives to ensure you you fish mainly in places where you catch the fish that are valuable and not overfished, mm -hmm. and avoid areas where um, where things that are at low levels might get caught by you. Um, and so this this goes like to the nth degree in some fisheries. So, so there's some fisheries off the U.S. West Coast and up in Alaska where um, particularly the fisheries that catch hake and pollock, which are very, very abundant, you're catching almost 99% or more of hake or pollock if you go and target one of those two species. But sometimes you catch one of these rockfish or sometimes up in Alaska you catch a salmon that's endangered. Mm -hmm. um, so it might be, it might be 99.9% clean but you're catching some chinook salmon or you're catching some canary rockfish or something and so what the fishing industry there has developed is they basically hire a private company every day when they go fishing every boat reports their catch where they fished what they caught to the private company private company compiles all the catch data if somebody caught a chinook salmon or canary rockfish or whatever something that's they shouldn't be catching. They send a message to the whole fleet that says, don't go and fish here. Someone caught canary rockfish. 
and the whole fleet avoids that area. So this is all done by the industry. And it's all because they have individual quota on all these different species um, and restrictions on how much you can catch of the sort of bycatch species. So, so this is an example of something that can work really well. Uh, now, industry is generally in favor of this. They don't want to be catching stuff that's bad. They don't want to get shut down because they exceeded the fleet-wide quota for something. But it also makes fishing much harder. <laughs> you know, I mean, you've got to sit there with your spreadsheet and say, well, I want to go catching Dover sole and sable fish and how much quota do I have and where can I go fishing that avoids these other things and can I cover my accidental catch of these other species if I do encounter them and where am I going to least quota from if I, if I do go over and, you know, it's, it's a different way of thinking. But they've adjusted, they've done remarkably well under the system. And, and so the system works it's you know the i mean the naive thing that i would worry about is that you know you pull up a rockfish and you go crap and you chuck it overboard uh they have observers in the vessels okay and there, there's so i guess what would happen is you would have you, you probably don't have observers on every vessel but you have like a statistical every vessel. really yeah wow that's how it works well that's really good <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had no idea but, but yeah, so, especially the big, the big vessels. So, in fact, the, the ones that fish for Hake and Pollock are really big vessels, and they, they actually have two, uh, two observers. So there's never a time when they could be fishing and not have someone on deck. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, a related question is, you know, when I was back, in, back home in Australia and I, I was going fishing with my father, um, you know, you, you have a size limitation on, on the fish that you can catch. But obviously, if I'm, you know, have these enormous, <laughs> these enormous nets, I'm not going through and counting every single fish and having a look at the size of each fish. Are there, how do the restrictions work on that end, just in terms of the sizes? Well, I mean, those trawl nets have mesh sizes. So the small fish go through the mesh and the big fish stay behind. Hmm. Um, so that's one way. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you catch the fish that are too small they're not going to be retained and and depending on the regulations those small fish would either count against your quota even if you don't retain them mm -hmm. um or if they survive when you throw them back overboard then some percentage of what you throw back overboard counts against your quota mm -hmm. so it just depends how you set it up it's, mm -hmm. it's i mean it's not a perfect system and it's not something you could implement everywhere but you know it is one way of dealing with it that's actually that's a very sort of sophisticated way i mean that's a very simple point that i had simply not thought of you can use your net as a filter <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's the general idea now, now i mean when you when you have a whole bunch of fish packed together in a mm -hmm. in the back of a, a trawling a, a gear you know, there's going to be some some damage to the fish themselves so it's not a perfect system mm -hmm. um so what happens in practice to bycatch because you hear about um I, I don't really know how the mechanisms work here but apparently from what i've read uh, fish farms are, are fed off fish meal and so fish meal is uh sort of waste product from fish and bycatch i thought so so how what what happens in, so <laughs> if i catch a dolphin what happens to that thing after what happens that <laughs> you know what happens to the dolphin after is it just thrown back into the ocean or does that become fish meal in practice what's going on there everybody pretty freaks out because <laughs> catching a dolphin is really bad news <laughs> uh, it doesn't get ground up and fed to farmed salmon though <laughs> 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 don't worry about that um so a couple of things being conflated here one thing is if you do catch something like a turtle or a dolphin or a, you know something that's an endangered species or a seabird or heaven forbid a short-tailed albatross up in Alaska, mm -hmm. um, then that gets reported um, and the fleet gets in trouble, the boat gets in trouble, um, mm -hmm. depending on the level of, of, of observer coverage. So fleets that are 100% observed, they would get reported. The individual boat wouldn't like be penalized, but there would be a, generally a quota for the entire um, fleet. So up in Alaska, it's like you can catch uh, what it was like, two short-tailed albatrosses in five years or something like that. Hmm. Um, 
And the same is for dolphin, dolphin uh, tuna fisheries, that if they accidentally catch dolphins, that's obviously a bad thing. But they have all these mechanisms for if dolphins get encircled in the tuna nets, they you now push the nets down and try and get the dolphins to escape so that it's all dolphin friendly and dolphin safe. That's where all those labels come from. Mm. Um, as far as where the food comes for um, aquaculture fish, it used to be a lot of it was fish meal, but they've, I mean, fish meal is really expensive. They don't want to be feeding their fish fish meal because it's expensive to source. Mm -hmm. And most of that fish meal came from Peruvian anchoveta, other small fish. Um, so they're uh, slowly developing or rapidly developing systems where you no longer, to produce a pound of salmon, you no longer need a pound of fish meal or fish mm -hmm. that go to fish meal. Those ratios are going way down. I believe it's less than one to one um, mm -hmm. for, for salmon aquaculture. Some of them are entirely doing it based on land-based, um, grain-based mm -hmm. feed and, and so on. Which so, may be more destructive according to what you said earlier. It, yeah, it just depends. You know, what, what do you want to protect? <laughs> you know, it's more, it is in some sense, more efficient to use grain than to use fish because fish eat other fish, which eat other things. So mm -hmm. your pound of fish meal comes from a lot more other stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's more efficient to, to, to feed things on, on plant matter than animal matter. See, this um, is what this is one of the things I was curious about: whether fish farms are actually fueling um, catches. No, I think it's more that that if you're catching lots of fish, um, that's low value. So mm -hmm. a lot of the anchovy, sardine, anchoveta, a lot of those are low value. You can catch them in very large quantities. They don't get you, there's not a big human consumption market. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that was always going to feed. It was going to pig feed and chicken feed and then aquaculture feed. Um, so um, so that, that, that has always happened. Um, what's a bit new is that um, uh, 30 or 40 years ago, um, a pretty high proportion of what was caught was being discarded, just purely mm -hmm. you catch stuff, we don't need all this other stuff, we're just going to throw it back overboard. And a lot of countries now, all that sort of trash fish is now being used. Mm. It's either being brought back and eaten by humans or it's being turned into, um, into fish feed. Um, so the actual rate of discards has gone down quite a lot over time. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned earlier labels. Um, so how... so. A few different questions. So there's this dolphin safe label and there's a few different uh, labels. You know, uh, what when when people are going out and they're buying food themselves, is there certain fish that they as consumers should be targeting? Or, um, you know, how, how effective are these labels at actually protecting species? And, and they sometimes get bad press that species are mislabeled. Are there DNA tests that are done? Yeah, it's, I, this is a lot of questions I'm throwing at you, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious about how the labeling systems work in general. Okay, so I would say, first of all, if you want to know what to go and buy, um, the MSC Eco Label is a really good one. The Monterey um, Seafood Watch Guide is really good. So if you want to know if your if your fish you want to eat is sustainable, you can look for the little labels that say MSC. That's a good one, or or um, you can download an app, the Seafood Watch, and look up your fish and say, is it the green list, the red, the orange? Is it is it safe to eat or not um, in terms of sustainability? So let somebody else make a decision for you. Um, and those eco-labels are very good. Um, I, they, get in, they get bad press, but usually the bad press is from people that don't want any fishing to happen. Mm -hmm. they're, they're really mad that any fishing is labeled as sustainable. And as I've said before, any type of fishing has environmental consequences. So there's nothing that is completely consequence free. When you go and catch fish, there's going to be fewer fish. Mm -hmm. And you might have some impacts to the environment. If you're trawling, there might be some impacts to the bottom. It, you might have some accidentally caught things in your, in your fish. So you, you've got to ask yourself, 
is it still better to eat fish than to eat beef when you know the beef might be coming from something where you cleared some rainforest in Brazil to grow beef for the American market? Mm-hmm. So, you know, what's your what's your trade-off? Um, but generally, eco-labels are pretty good. Um, I haven't really looked into the dolphin-friendly and dolphin-safe labels, but they did drive an enormous reduction in how many dolphins were caught and killed in tuna fisheries, something like a 99% oh. uh, reduction in dolphins caught uh, from the 1970s to the present. Mm-hmm. So those have had an, a huge, huge impact in terms of incentives. Um, a lot of what that dolphin-friendly uh, labels have done is changed how they catch tuna. It used to be that you would go look for a school of dolphins and you know they were going <laughs> to be attacking a school of tunas mm-hmm. or, or mixed with them or they're all fishing them. They're all trying to catch the same fish. Mm-hmm. And so you'd encircle the whole thing and then hopefully some of the dolphins escaped and you caught all the tuna, but mostly you caught a bunch of dolphins too. So that type of fishing has changed um, and is no longer done as much. Mm-hmm. And mostly because of all these labels. And instead what they do is they they send out these floating um, structures they call fish aggregating devices. It turns out if you just send something floating like a boat, all the fish will school underneath the boat. So if you send out just like a floating structure, fish aggregating device, a fad, mm-hmm. all the fish will aggregate underneath it. And then you can just go put your net around the whole lot and catch all the fish that are underneath it. It's almost um, unfair, isn't it? It's <laughs> yeah, and so they have these systems now. I mean, now they're very sophisticated. They'll 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 create these fads that have like a camera underneath them and a a GPS device on them, and and so and then they set them going, and they, they float gradually from uh, say the west coast of uh, Central and South and North America. They float westwards, aggregating fish underneath them, and then. You go check check the camera and it says, oh, there are lots of fish under this one. And so you send the boat to the GPS location and you nab all the fish. Who so it owns, sounds like the perfect system. Who owns these? It, it, these must be huge companies that are uh, doing this, no? Or- yeah, all, the, all the, the, the tuna fishing companies do this, yeah. Huh. And the problem, the problem with this is you're catching fewer dolphins, but now you're catching lots of small sharks and other species you don't want to catch. So there's bycatch of other species, but it's not dolphins. So <laughs> and is people it care more about dolphins. Is it better or is it worse? Well, I don't know. As I said, there's no there's no way of catching fish that's totally free of of environmental consequences. And I guess if you weren't using these techniques, it may not be economically viable to start with to go out and actually do the t- the catch. Yeah, obviously they're making more money doing that than they would by fishing some other way. So can I ask, uh, in terms of regulations and labeling, the, so you're in the States and there's a, in terms of, um, you know, the, the market, how, how much is imported and, and how, how much is domestic? Between 63 and 67% is imported. And the rest is produced domestically. The, the reason why I ask is because, you know, in terms of, well, you know, does the US, for example, import fish from non-well-managed and non-well-regulated uh, regions? Yes, we do. And that's uh, certainly a concern. And that's why I mean, looking at those MSC eco-labeling is important and looking at the Monterey Bay sea- Seafood Watch Guide is important. Um, you know, the U.S. does have a bunch of regulations on what is considered to be sustainable and to some extent reduces what comes in. Mm-hmm. But largely it's driven by the market. So um, largely it's driven by whatever's cheap and plentiful and um, people like eating. Mm-hmm. Um, much of what America likes eating is is aquaculture now. Mm-hmm. You know, so this top. this is uh, this is what I was curious about because it, it could be the case that okay you have a well managed system over here and all that's happening is <laughs> you know it could be that you, you place all these restrictions and it makes it much more uh, expensive to fish in this particular region and so you just push the problem over into this region where now it's cheap to fish 
And but this sounds like uh, you know if if there are these um, uh, these these bodies that put you know they can certify that this this fish was caught in a sustainable uh, fishery and and consumers actually look at those and actually follow those that that sounds like it is a good solution if, if consumers do act appropriately um yeah if if consumers follow the labels that would make a difference um way. do they follow the labels mm, i mean there's some evidence that people are willing to pay a little bit more for a for a fish with a sustainable label and there's some grocery stores in the u.s that will only stock mm-hmm. sustainably caught uh, seafood others are not not so discriminating um, so, for example, if you go to a really expensive grocery store, um, you know, the sort of, uh, without naming any names, the, the one that has only organic food and only locally grown whatever, um, that's very, very expensive, you'll be able to buy all the fish there that's all sustainably caught, uh, no matter where it was caught, um, and not worry about, oh, do I need to think about this one versus this one versus this one? Which of these is okay? It gets very confusing. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an issue that are we just importing fish from badly managed places elsewhere? Mm-hmm. Um, that, that certainly could be an issue. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of what America catches is exported and a lot of what we eat is imported yeah. and a lot of what we catch is exported, processed and re-imported. Mm-hmm. So it gets complicated. You know, I mean, we catch a lot of salmon, send it overseas, process it, import it back to the U.S. because it's cheaper to process it mm-hmm. at, in another country than in the U.S. Um, cl- that, that sounds like in some sense it does make sense that you would eat imported fish and then export domestic fish because, you know, if the processing plants are all overseas, you send the fish in one direction, you process it, you don't want to send it back in you know you don't want to do two trips whereas you can process fish from china or, or somewhere else and then it takes one trip to the states um do, do you see what i'm saying yeah it, yeah it, it i mean of- if everything's if there are all these economic arguments all i can say is that the worst thing you can do is have have your seafood flown to you <laughs> <laughs> if it's shipped to you on a ship frozen there's no problem if it's flown to you, then you're in trouble. So if you're eating Maine lobster that got flown to you from the East Coast to the West Coast, the CO2 impact of that is an or, you know, way, 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 way higher than catching Pollock in Alaska, shipping it out to somewhere in Asia to be processed and shipping it back mm-hmm. on a ship that's frozen. That The carbon output is very small compared to flying something somewhere. So essentially, if you're eating fish in Alice Springs, you're very naughty. Depends how it gets there. If it's on the back of a truck or a train. I I'm imagine sorry, it's, flown it's flown in. there. Pretty bad. <laughs> it's if probably it's still flown in there. around in the fish tank, pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's probably flown in with flowers from <laughs> various places. But um, <laughs> so what about... Um, Okay, so there's there's mislabeling, which is it sounds like mislabeling is not a big problem. I, I mean, this this does get a bad rap, but uh... Uh, m- mislabeling. Um, so so here, here's 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 what I always say. People that do these studies on DNA testing, if fish are mislabeled, they'll go to like a sushi restaurant and sample the most expensive things for sale and discover that some of them are are actually cheaper types of seafood being sold as expensive types of seafood or horse or something. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, But if you think about what seafood is sold in America, most of it is like tilapia, salmon, whitefish, you know, your, your, your tin of canned tuna is not mislabeled. Mm-hmm. Okay. Your tilapia you're buying in the sea, sea, in the seafood thing is not mislabeled. Your salmon you're buying is almost certainly not mislabeled, and we were too easy to catch just visually. Um, and so, so you know, you'll see the study that says forty percent of seafood is mislabeled, but it's like forty percent of like expensive types of seafood cats sold in a sushi restaurant, and 
how, what proportion of fish sold in America is sold in sushi restaurants compared with canned tuna and supermarkets and so on? Um, the answer is that most, most seafood sold in America is sold in supermarkets. And most of what's sold there is, is not subject to mislabeling because why would you substitute something for tilapia? <laughs> it's like the cheapest possible seafood you can, you can eat. <laughs> mm-hmm. I see, I see, I see. The, then the other question is, sorry, I, at the moment, the questions are a little bit disconnected from one, one another, but this, <laughs> the next one is, um, you know, uh, the other thing I'm curious about is, so I'm originally from Australia, and if you read Australian news, um, you often you, the way Australian news speaks about China is, I guess, how in America the news might speak about Russia, let's say. Or China now as well, but um, so you often hear stories about illegal fishing done by these massive Chinese ghost fleets, and um, I, I wanted to get a sort of a more realistic idea of how big this problem actually is. Um, I haven't looked at it myself, so I've probably just read the same reports you have and what other people have told me. But it does seem like there are enormous fleets, Chinese-owned uh, fleets of fishing vessels that go all over the world and, and go fishing wherever they can. Mm-hmm. So that's certainly that's certainly a big issue. Um, yeah, uh, that needs to be regulated. But how how do you do that when it's open waters mostly? Mm-hmm. Um, if it's high seas, there are no regulations. So yeah, I I don't know what I can do about that. Um, but yeah, that's bad. So, so there's no there's no international controls at all in in international waters. So there's there's no well, there are those international management bodies I talked about that manage tuna and so on. The thing the thing is that your country has to belong to an international management body, and also abide by its rules. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that would be a question for those for those international management bodies. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard. I mean, if a big fleet of boats arrives in off the Galapagos and you have one patrol vessel, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. I mean, I see, this is the question I was curious about whether these bodies actually have the power to enforce <laughs> their regulations or any regulations they put in place. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult for international waters. Mm-hmm. Very difficult. But but surely you can at least tag the boats. You can set, you can take pictures of them. You you can see where they're coming from. Um, this, and then this, what? I'm not and sure. Then what do you do with them? Well, I, I don't know what you do with them, report but you have them the information. <laughs> yeah, report them to China. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. It, it's a start, if, though. Is I mean, it not? If they're officially <laughs> sanctioned fleets, then China's not going to do anything about it. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I wonder. And I guess they can always return to China through international waters. It's not like, you know, they have to pass through Japan's waters or anything like this. They, there's always a way around, right? Well, I mean, even if you wanted to stop them, what would you do? You're going to send a, a battleship to arrest a fleet of 100 boats? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I mean, the police pull over cars on the road all the time and they don't pull over all the hundreds of them, right? There must be a way. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's difficult. I mean, I mean, Australia's had some experience with this. And by the way, I'm sorry, I have to leave. I have a meeting in two minutes. Oh, okay. Um, but um, yeah, Australia's chased after poachers in 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 some other places, like the, the famous case of a Chilean sea bass uh, poacher that got chased for like five weeks by by an Australian patrol boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it wasn't worth it in the end. Since you have to run away, let, let me just finish on something very, very quickly. So um, can you place, can you make a picture of um, sort of, if, if, you, if you could, uh, your ideal, uh, if, if you wanted to put in place a system to effectively uh, manage marine you know, the fisheries across the world, what, what would that picture look like? And, and what do we need to do to get to that sort of ideal, idealized uh, system that you'd want to put, put in place? Um, I don't think you can do that because every place is different. Mm-hmm. Um, I can describe a system that would work for richer countries, which would be you have a monitoring system in place that monitors how many fish there are. You have a system that says, given that, 
given those numbers, you can set a catch level that's sustainable, that is going to give you fish, that's going to give you profits and jobs and employment, um, and a, a, a method for setting the setting the catches that's monitored, that's monitored and regulated, um, and a way of monitoring how many you catch, so that all that's counted accounted for properly. Um, that system would work, and it has. We've shown that has worked in lots of countries. Mm -hmm. um, a system that works in um, places where it's not possible to do that. There's not the money available to do the monitoring. There's not the money for the enforcement. Um, a better system there is to rely on closing some areas to fishing and having some refuge from fishing um, in conjunction with making sure that people aren't fishing with destructive fishing gear, because that's a bit easier to monitor. If, you know, you shouldn't go fishing with dynamite. You shouldn't go fishing with poison. You know, maybe uh, drift nets are bad. Gill, gill nets are bad because they're catching lots of things indiscriminately. So you're only allowed to fish with certain types of fishing gear. Um, so that can work better in, in areas where you, you can't have this intensive monitoring and assessment and regulation and so on. But there's no, there's no perfect system that works everywhere. Um, there are partial solutions in different places that have worked well in, in a particular system, in a particular country with a particular set of guiding values. Um, but it's really hard to generalize. I guess what happens is as nations develop, they can be entered into the club. Uh, and hopefully eventually you cover the entire world's oceans with good regulation. Yeah, I mean, but in places where you have 150 species of coral reef fish that are all accessible by going 100 yards offshore, mm -hmm. that's, that's, you know, the systems that work in rich countries are not going to work there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I suppose if you're looking at those non-industrialized fleets, probably do less damage. So at least you have that going for you. Depends how many they are fishing. <laughs> There's lots of people fishing. They can catch a lot of fish. <laughs> I was trying to give some sort of positive spin at the very end there, but you're making it difficult. <laughs> but, it all uh, depends. You should know by now. Scientists will just answer everything with it depends. <laughs> well, uh, with that being said, Trevor Ranch, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. It's been fun chatting. <laughs>